Hello, hello everyone. So great to have you back again. If uh, you were here last week and a warm welcome to those of you that are here joining us for the first time. As you know, this is a three part series and today is finger plays and movement, which is going to be very useful for all of us, I'm sure. Um, without further ado, I'm Leslie. I think we can be on a first name basis now. I'm here with Rob and Marilyn who will be in the background uh, taking care of details. And um, we're just going to keep going because I know there's a lot of content to cover. If you were not here last week, I'll just repeat this very briefly. Uh, for a series, we ask that you attend live for all three sessions to be able to receive a certificate of attendance. So um, we will take care of all of that after the last session. This is recorded. You can always have access to that. Uh, Lisa again gave us an incredible list of fantastic resources as an extension to today's um, topic. And that will be all available to you at the link that Marilyn will be posting in the chat box. Um, so if you were here last week, uh, you, you heard the long-winded version of our bio for Lisa. Um, she is an experienced educator all the way from pre-K through the college level, and we covered all that last week. So I like to keep it interesting when we get to um, have the same people back and back again. So here's something um, additional about Lisa that maybe you didn't know. In her spare time, she's a landlord to uh, these beautiful bluebirds. And um, today is an exceptionally exciting day. Um, or we were calling it earlier a bird day because one of them hatched this morning. So uh, Lisa is more cheerful than her usual cheerful self because of this incredible happening today. So um, a really fun fact about Lisa that she is a true lover of birds and she's got her own, very own bird family that um, I think it's probably rent free, but we can talk about that later. So with that being said, um, I'm going to turn off my camera and turn it over to, to Lisa. Uh, welcome, everyone. I am so happy to see so many new people. And oh, Vanetta, I love birds too. Oh, me, me, me. I love birds. Um, uh, it is a very special day here because I had four bluebird eggs um, and one of them, the first one hatched today. So it's, it's extra special and there should be, with any luck, three more hatchlings in the next three days for a complete brood. And, um, and uh, it's just, it's so astonishing to see the whole process from beginning to end. It's really thrilling. So I am, I'm, I really am in extra good spirits today and I hope you are too. Uh, oh, bluebirds, I, okay, you could get me started on bluebirds and I'll forget to talk about the rest. So, um, Marilyn, are you there? Yes. Okay, uh, are you asking me to do that? Oh, you're talking to someone else. I'm sorry, yeah, I thought you yeah, were asking okay. me to restart the yeah, webinar. Carry on. <laughs> okay, sorry, I will, I will close over here. Move over to my uh, speech, all right. Um, today's objectives, so you got a little ahead of me, but that's okay. Um, today's objectives, of course, uh, one more, one, sorry. Um, we're going to identify some brain supporting reasons that finger plays and movement should be incorporated daily, not just occasionally, and hopefully not just for filler or fluff. Um, we're going to learn how to extend and adapt some finger plays and movement to include all learners and get some tips and resources. And there are a lot of resources to make all these movements matter and be impactful. All right, so just the basics here. I know you are all familiar with this, but I really feel com compelled to make sure we're all on the same page. So a finger play, sometimes called an action rhyme, is just a short poem, a song. It could be a chant or a rhyme or even a little story. Um, and it always involves some sort of hand or arm movement. So those are finger plays. If you're doing a large body movement, then it becomes gross motor. Um, these things have been passed down for generations and generations, um, starting, I think, with lullabies way back in the day. And, um, and if you're doing a, what we would consider a finger play for very young children, infants and toddlers, it would be considered a bounce 
or a tickle. So the bounce is where you bounce your child on your knee and you recite some rhyme, or a tickle if it's an infant and you're googly googly and you're moving their hands and fingers and toes and arms and legs, then that's uh, a tickle. So that's how we spread the joy across early childhood. Something for everyone. So there are four benefits of music and finger plays and movements. Going on. <laughs> So, of course, language and communication is huge. That's the most obvious thing because we're fostering active listening. Children are learning to follow directions, stay focused um, from beginning to end. So you're developing stamina for listening and doing. Um, of course, lots of phonemic awareness, rhyming, um, even phonics are incorporated in um, finger plays and poems and songs. I, I think of those all kind of lumped together, but for the purpose of today, I'll focus on finger plays. Um, and you're also improving auditory and visual discrimination as you're using your fingers to do various movements. You're coordinating both sides of the brain. And we know how uh, important that is. So, and it gives the children a lot of opportunities to practice their communication skills and their social skills. So it really builds on um, the natural inclination of children to share and enjoy these sorts of experiences in a social context. Um, word sounds, patterns, the intonation or the, the prosody of language. So your rhythm uh, language patterns, the rhythms, the intonations, the lilt in your voice, that's all prosody. And those things are all beginning to get in, ingrained in the brain when you start using a lot of language uh, in finger plays with children. So, and I love this part. You're actually modeling through some of these finger plays, the narrative form, which is going to become really critical as children develop their uh, early reading and literacy skills. So the narrative is just think about the itsy bitsy spider. It tells a teeny tiny story. There's a beginning, a middle, an end, and there's a main character, a setting, the water spout, and the problem, he keeps getting washed out, and a solution, which is to climb up again. And I, I think that's so cool that that is all entwined in this little itty bitty finger play. Thank you. Um, of course, for me, one of the biggest issues is getting kids engaged. You want them to be able to repeat these actions, not only with you, but with their peers and at home. So repetition really is the goal. So as soon as you can hook a child on the excitement and the fun of doing a finger play or a gross motor activity with music, especially, um, not only are you tapping into those multi-sensory um, uh, and kinesthetic issues, but you're also developing a sense of repetition because, oh, it triggers something in the brain and they're like, oh, I liked this last time, this was fun. And I remembered it because the music helps ingrain the words and the movements all together. And so those sorts of triggers then become something that fosters independent repetition. And that is really a key goal. We want kids to be able to come back and do these things again and again and again because they learn from fun and repetition. So, and of course, all the while you're developing, um, you're developing executive function skills. And if you've had any children with um, autism or even ADHD and other uh, disabilities, executive function skills, I can tell you, are, are kind of the key piece to being successful in life in general. So focusing attention, planning, follow through, self-regulation, all of those are part of executive function skills and can be really beautifully developed through finger plays and movements. All right, imagination, of course, and more. So as soon as you're activating the brain and you're imagining what it might be like to be the little spider sliding down with the water rushing down like a, like a giant water slide at the park, um, you're encouraging imagination and the children are visualizing. Those are also skills that help enhance their own understanding of language and, um, and develops self-confidence. And for those kids in your class who are English language learners, it certainly adds all another layer of support for their um, language development as well. And it's just fun, just joyous. 
Thanks. So on motor skills, I think um, the motor skills, of course, are the one the gross motor skills are the ones that develop our large muscles, arms, legs, and our core, our torso, something I need to do a lot more finger plays and movement activities for. Um, but we're also, of course, developing uh, finger, finger grip and necessary um, grasp, uh, pincer grasp, and those sorts of uh, fine motor movements that will help in writing, cutting, and all of those tiny little skills that are also important. Um, and I think it's important to, to note too that um, there are a lot of instruments that can facilitate those different muscles. So shakers, if you can add some rhythm shakers, you're grasping, you're holding, you're shaking, you're pinching a clave stick and those sorts of things. So anytime you can incorporate rhythm instruments, I know it gets loud and exciting, but if you can incorporate those, you're actually adding a, a boost to those motor skill development, developments of motor skills. <laughs> So how do we set ourselves up for success for finger plays? The first thing you do is just select your finger play. And the most critical part is to learn it. And I know that sounds silly, but I can't tell you how many times I have sat down to do a finger play and just drawn a blank, forgotten how the tune goes or whatever. I may even model that for you today. <laughs> but it is really critical that you learn the finger play or the song or the movements that go with it so that there's really no lag time for the students. Could you know, the minute that you drift off going, now what was that? They've all started talking and thinking about other things. So you wanna maintain their, uh, their engagement by knowing it well enough that you could just start launch right in and go straight through. So then you're going to introduce it to the children. And when I say introduce, I just mean, tell them why you selected it. I, I thought it was very rainy. We've had a lot of rain this week. And I'd like to talk about a little spider friend I know who gets caught up in the rainstorm and the rain washes him out of his spout. Something like that to, to give an introduction as to why this matters, why it's, uh, why it's valuable to them or what they're going to hear about and then pre-teach whatever actions or vocabulary you might need to teach. If we're using itsy bitsy spider, you might need to talk about what a downspout is or go to the window and look out and point out a downspout or talk about downspouts at home so that they understand the language, the, the vocabulary before you begin. So in the, in the essence of time here, I'm going to just tell you that I personally use the I do, we do, you do strategy. I do, which is recite the finger play, start slowly, exaggerate the inflection, include my gestures, and I cue the students just with this gesture, they know, to, um, to get them to echo my words and my actions. And we go slowly. Then we do, we do it all together slowly again, repeat a few times as needed, and we get a little faster each time if we can. And then the you do part is I ask them to lead as a group and I follow along with their um, gestures and kind of coach them through it. Um, so we do it that way so that they get plenty of practice. And uh, again, we're, we're looking for the goal of being able to repeat this on their own independently. So that's how I would normally approach it. I don't have time to do it that way with you. And you would just see a lot of me moving my lips and pointing at you all at home to do that or at work to do, to do the gesture. So um, with that said, I'm going to share a wonderful song called Everybody Clap. And it's by Nancy Kopman. She has her own website if you're ever interested in checking it out. She's got loads of wonderful songs, just like this one. Um, okay, this is the part where I said I might blank out. I, I, I know so many clapping songs that I have to give myself a second to remember. Everybody clap your hands, clap your hands, clap your hands. Everybody clap your hands, clap your hands, clap your hands. Yeah you just repeat the same melody twice. That's why it's twice. And then it goes, everybody clap your hands, clap your hands, clap your hands. Everybody clap your hands, clap your hands, clap your hands. Everybody stomp your feet, stomp your feet, stomp your feet. Everybody stomp your feet, stomp your feet, stomp your feet. Everybody stomp your feet, stomp your feet, stomp your feet. Everybody stomp your feet, stomp your feet, stomp your feet. 
And then the last part is peekaboo. Everybody go peekaboo. Everybody go peekaboo. You know, they love that part. And on. There are other motions to the song, uh, swaying side to side. Everybody go one, two, three, woo. Or uh, everybody clap your hands as the nice circle back and end with everybody clap your hands again to end the song. And that's when you tie it back to the very beginning of the first gesture that usually signals to kids, they, they learn that that means it's, that's the wrap up part. That's where we're ending. So, and if you were in a standing uh, position, you could say, everybody sit back down, sit back down, sit back down and so forth. And that's another wonderful way to transition to whatever your next activity might be. Everybody line up, line up, line up. You fill in what you need to do and make it work for you. Okay, so um, I know you're all singing fast with me at, at, at work and at home, and I'm sorry to be singing alone. It's no fun to do that because <laughs> I really enjoy singing with other people. So I'm trusting that you're all singing along with me as best you can. Um, all right, so when we think about how we can extend the basic uh, finger plays or chants or rhymes, of course, we use them throughout the day. They don't have to be just used for transitions. Um, I had an, opportun an opportunity to use a lot of finger plays um, when we were lined up, and I, I was in an elementary building teaching kindergarten at the time, we were lined up waiting for picture day. So everybody's all primped, we're all queued up uh, in you know, order of height and all of that. And uh, everybody had combs. Well, that was exciting. Everybody had a comb. Thank you, Lisa, for singing with me. Um, and oh, it was just a lot, it was a lot to handle. So we all sat on the combs and then we sat and did finger plays. And because we were in the hallway, we had to do it quietly. So we practiced doing it in our regular voices and then in our tiny voices back and forth. It was great, but it really did help manage the time and uh, keep them engaged uh, at a time when I really needed to not have them all going wild with combs and messing each other's hair up. <laughs> All right, so wait times, anytime you have that kind of wait time, that's great. An opportunity to refocus and get them back together when they've been a little uh, chaotic. And I love that these are things that they can take home and teach to their own families and, and repeat, rinse and repeat there. Um, Yes, and lining up and waiting for the teacher all of those times. Absolutely. Thanks, Wendy. Um, so one of the key things that you can do with uh, almost any finger play is just to find a way to cross the midline. I know we talked about this last time as well, but crossing the midline, that's that invisible line that splits the two hemispheres of your brain, crossing the midline um, actually activates the opposite side of your brain. And that helps because it, then the neurotransmitters can speak to one another on both sides um, of your hemisphere. And that actually develops countless, like millions of neurons. So uh, that is countless. So um, infinity neurons and uh, is, is really critical to helping children develop not only cognitively, but physically. And when you see the kids that have trouble making X's, for instance, those are the kids who are not able to cross the midline. So crossing midlines, uh, crossing the midline is really, really a useful tool. So just take a simple song like, um, twinkle twinkle and instead of just doing the twinkle twinkle up here have them cross their midline twinkle twinkle little star how i wonder what you are and so forth and then uh, up just a point here um for those of you who may know asl the typical thing to do is up above the world so high like a diamond in the sky and i'm I don't want to put too fine a point on it, but in ASL, in American Sign Language, that's the sign for a body part, female body part. And so I have switched since, since I learned that to making a letter D for diamond. And you point at your ring finger as if you were making the diamond glow or shine, sparkle. Like a diamond in the sky. So anytime you can do these actions and cross the midline, it's a bonus. It's like extra bonus points. 
So, and of course, adapting songs to allow children to add their own. Some people call those zipper songs or zipper zippers, where you can ask the child to contribute, you know, the name of an animal or a word or phrase or even a motion of their own. Get them engaged in creating their own motions, including those that cross the midline. Once you explain this to them and how important it is for their brains, they will help you come up with ways to cross the midline. Mm -hmm. All right, the, the photo you see here is actually one of my own <clears throat> interactive charts. Um, yes, oh, Joan, thank you for the snap of the turtle, snap of the flea. That's an oldie, but a goodie. I love that. Um, actually, just a note here, um, Deanne, you mentioned that you didn't know a lot about ASL and it's really a, a wonderful tool and preschoolers can learn to do some of the simple signs. Do look it up. Um, I, I encourage you, there are lots of sites for preschool uh, ASL. And anytime you can incorporate movement, including ASL, um, you are you're just amping it up. So it's all good. Look into it, it's really fun too. So um, the chart here is my, one of my interactive charts. And um, anytime that you can make language and print Vis visible and interactive, you're going to get the kids more engaged and they can repeat the song or the finger play in a different format. So that's a great way to do that. Um, some people use pocket charts. Uh, that's just a different method of kind of the same thing. And um, flannel boards, magnetic manipulatives, all good. So uh, a couple of other ideas I, I wanted to highlight on this page, uh, mamalisa.com is a website by a woman named Lisa Yanucci, and she has collected from around the world finger plays, um, folk dances, and uh, even a few recipes from, uh, from all, over the, all over the world. Um, and so they're not focused on our traditional uh, nursery rhymes that we most of us grew up with. Instead, they're nursery rhymes and finger plays from other places in the world. And it is so cool. You can search by country or theme and, um, and uh, find just a, a wealth of resources there. And that helps bring in other cultures. So think about the students in your class. If you have children from Somali or Germany or wherever, go to Mama Lisa's world and look up some things that come specifically from those countries and integrate those. So great fun and great culture. Um, for the question about ASL, remind me, and, and I can talk uh, further about ASL maybe afterward or do a Q&A about some ASL questions if you have those later. Um, anyway, and then experiment with the sound of children's voices. I love to do character voices. So we'll, we'll sing, I, I'm picking on the same thing, but <laughs> we'll sing. Uh, any any of your finger play songs in the voice of uh, Mickey Mouse or Donald Duck or a sad elephant, whatever. And again, that's a great opportunity to get children involved in helping make those decisions so that they feel participatory and engaged. Thanks. All right. So here is another one of my favorites. This is how many raindrops make a storm. Some people call this um, uh, some people call this the pitter patter song. It kind of depends on how you learned it. And my version may be slightly different than the one you learned, but I got this tip um, from Ms. Rachel. I happened to, I was looking for a link to share with you of someone doing this song. And I loved um, that she did, she did the pitter patter like this, matching the fingertips, pitter patter, pitter patter. I love that. That's fantastic fine motor. And I hadn't ever seen that done before, so I was thrilled. Um, anyway, the way I learned this is to uh, start by um, with your hands rubbing very quietly together. This is just clouds collecting overhead. And then that becomes a silent, or not silent, but a, a quiet little storm brewing. And then you start patting. I don't know if you can hear that, but I'm patting on my legs. And then it gets louder. And then we sing, bitter, patter, bitter, pat, see the raindrops fall, falling one by one. 
How many raindrops make a storm? One little raindrop, no, no, no. Two little raindrops, no, no, no. Three little raindrops, no, no, no. Millions of raindrops make a storm. Billions of raindrops make a storm. Pitter, patter, pitter, patter. And then I continue and go backward the way I started. Then pitter, patter, pitter, patter. See the raindrops fall, falling one by one. And you can end it if you'd like to by doing the loud storm and then back down to the quieter storm and then end with, or you can end it as it was on the screen. Oh, thank you for enlarging that. That was an oops, that was an oops on my part. Let's oh, I thought you were just happened. highlighting that because that's- No, I wasn't. <laughs> so let's see. And I was just gonna give you a, um, a heads up that um, we're, we are at 125, 126. All so right. we're gonna speed through Zoom. the next couple. Yep, speed we're reading. Um, this is about adapting. Remember that kid, lots of kids have trouble with sensory overload. So go slowly, only sing a little verse, uh, one verse at a time or just the chorus. Um, uh, be sure to slow the pace. Of course, I'm doing this all at kind of breakneck speed today, but you would slow the pace for those children that need to go a little slower. Um, use, I like to use cue cards to, you know, if you're using body parts, get a picture. These are easy to find online of body parts or just take a photograph yourself and make picture cards so that kids can know what's coming next. That's really helpful for some of those children who have sensory issues. Um, I'm going to scoot to the. I'm going to scoot to the yes. next one, knowing that everybody will yes. have access to these slides. Absolutely. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, let's see if I just want to see if. Oh, break it down into smaller parts. I call that bid. Break it down. Just remember that if a song is long, just do one verse today and a chorus, and then teach the second verse tomorrow or whatever. Um, just to break it down into smaller bits so that it's doable. Um, and you can enlist peers to, um, to help you know, match the child who's having a problem with a peer that can help them uh, signal or cue the movements. There's a lot of this about movement activities and I wish I had time to share. But um, I think um, the thing I, I think that's important to highlight here, again, crossing the midline, but um, Repetitive gross motor movements actually release dopamine in your brain, which is the mood and motivation reward center. So when you're doing repetitive movements, it's actually re sending out a signal. This is great. This is a wonderful treat for me. And it again, in, engages the child to want to do it again and, and uh, more often. Oops, sorry, hold on. That's okay. Okay, uh, let's see. I just want to mention, I'm gonna mention the bubbles. That's my favorite one on that page. Um, bubbles, if you blow bubbles, you can encourage children to stand tall, to reach up and snap, catch the bubbles or, or pop the bubbles, encourage them to stand up on their tiptoes um, and uh, capture the bubbles. Then you can say, all right, pop a bubble on your elbow. Now they may not get it on the elbow, but you can try like this or on your shoulder or on the top of your head, on your chin, whatever you can identify body parts. I love doing that with the children and they love the bubbles. Um, and then story movements, try to incorporate, like if you're reading The Very Hungry Caterpillar, try to incorporate movements that would reflect what's happening in the story. Can you, can you wiggle like a caterpillar on the floor? Can you munch? Can you curl up in a cocoon? We'll go on to the next. Would you like me to do this one? I mean, I would. Okay. I don't want to hold people up though, but this, we're almost to the very end. Yeah. Okay. So this one is an oldie, a, a really old one, but it's called Georgie. Every morning at half past eight, I go ooh, 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 to Georgie. And every morning at half past eight, he goes ooh, 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 to me. No need to knock. No need to ring. 
As I rub my eyes, I open the window and stick out my head and sing ooh, 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 to Georgie. So there's so much packed in there. You can change the child's name, of course. You can make a different sound, the onomatopoeic sounds for buzzer or ring. Um, you can stick out, the kids love to do this, stick out their tongues. Open the window and stick out your tongue and go ooh, 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 to Georgie. It's all about what you'll tolerate in your own room, but that's one of the favorites, of course. So there's lots of ways that you can adapt that. So thank you for joining to me, joining me today for this uh, parade, fast parade through finger plays and movements. And um, that's, <laughs> you're welcome. And um, if you go to the next page, that's how we can connect. But if you go yeah. to the next- oh, All right, actually, yes, so Leslie. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna <laughs> scoot to, um, because we need to do this, just yes. um, a quick, quick second to just um, ask you to do this poll for us, please. And uh, then we're going to come back on and Lisa um, has an added uh, promotion to offer you. So please hang in there. Bonus. A, yep. Always a bonus. Always a bonus when you're working with Lisa. <laughs> so we're so appreciative. Everybody looks like they're just kind of jumping on. Yeah. Thank so you, everybody. Get to the next part. As soon as we get most of the people to respond, we will get, we have like three more slides. And the, the code, the coupon code for my website, which is Little Songbird is at the very end. So when we get to that one, okay, we can we're get getting there. That code. Yeah. Just letting them know that it's still to come. Thank you. And thank you, Mildred. Goodness. I'm feeling the love everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. And, and Lisa is such a good multitasker. She was able to present, keep up on the chat, um, <laughs> sing, remember tunes. I mean, it, imp impressive stuff. So I'm going to end well, the poll now. We got a lot of good responses. Thank you so much. We are all good at multitasking as educators, <laughs> aren't we? Yeah. Oh, there it is. All right. National Day of Joy, folks, is June 29th. And in celebration of that, I am offering you at my website, this is not a Becker thing, it's just for people here in the Becker webinar, uh, on my site, which is littlesongbird.com, um, you can get 25% off your entire cart of songs. So it's basically like, I, I hesitate to use this because it's a thing, but iTunes, but for teachers, all the songs on my website are uh, pre-K through second grade appropriate. And, um, uh, and you can get, you know, lots and lots of music for your summertime or for fall if you're stocking up ahead of time and save 25% off all of that through next week. And then we'll have one more offer, a different one for next week. Sounds great, Lisa. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And I'm seeing a lot of comments about the web and uh, the link to the evaluation. I, I don't, I'm not okay. seeing all the chat, but I saw. All right. Yeah, we'll let Marilyn kind of. I'm handle all that. Oh, all those right, you're right. They, they, missed the, they missed the poll. Some people missed taking the poll. Oh, so yeah. Sorry. Okay. I rushed them. Yeah, um, that's okay if they missed it. Yeah, that's okay. Um, just tell us in the chat how how you felt about the. Uh, the I think there were th three very simple questions, um, and just just let us know if it was helpful to you, if it was valuable, if this is a um, something that you would recommend to somebody else you know. That helps us um, make plans for future webinars for sure. So we're just repeating our links here. And Lisa very gr graciously shares um, many resources after each session because as you see, and I feel quite guilty that we rush her through when she has so That's much okay. more she wants to share. So um, please do check out our resources. Um, and also we have at Becker's many uh, musical instruments, accessories, um, books um, that come along with music and finger play suggestions. So you'll, you'll want to check that out as well. Oh, good question. What was the code? <laughs> oh, so Great go back. Uh, the was code, it on there? <laughs> the code is joy. Oh, okay. Joy. <laughs> I don't know how there. to manage to leave that off. It was on there originally, and then I think I accidentally booted it off. Okay. Code <laughs> is joy. Code joy. Okay, great. 
great, great, great. I'm so glad somebody Thank you for asking. somebody spoke up. <laughs> and next week, same time, same place. We look forward to having you all back. Uh, if you want to share the share the joy and let um, other people know that they can, of course, chime in at any any point in this series. Yeah. So next week would be the 29th. That will be our last session. And the topic is the joy of music outdoors, which is kind of timely for this time of year. So many, many, many thanks to all of you. And of course, to Lisa, who did an incredible job. And I don't know how you'd be able to not tune in next week and find out more Bluebird <laughs> updates. Hopefully so. by next week, they'll all be hatched and I can give an update. <laughs> Okay, we look we look forward to that. So please uh, continue to uh, put fill in your, the chats as you wish. Um, in the next few minutes, we can hang in there a little bit and um, answer any questions you might have. There's one question in the chat. Yes, or in the uh, Q and A. So, um, oh, that to me, uh, said uh, I'm struggling in circle and making up a line. Um, any solution, please? Uh, I, if I understand the question, but. Um, in circle and making up line. Uh, hmm. Yeah, I'm okay. challenged. I'm not sure I'm understanding the question, Fatima. Yeah, I don't know if Fatima is still here, but um, I would happily answer if I got just a little more clarification from yeah. Fatima about what. Here's the exact question. Okay. Oh. Yeah, circle time and making up the line with kids. Making up the line, like as in getting lined up or getting the kids in the circle. Not quite sure which kind of line we're asking about, but um, one, one method that I've used for getting the children in a circle is to take um, a super long, you can buy these, but you can also make them just take a piece of, um, you know, like nylon cord and make it as big as your circle would be, you would do that, you could do this with a parachute too if you were outside um, eat more easily and just have the children all hold a part of the circle of the, the you know, string or rope that's tied together into a giant circle so that they're all kind of spaced out. And then they lay down the, um, the rope or whatever you've used in front of them and then you can continue and then just have them sit kind of around the circle. I think um, Sheila has a great question here too, which okay. is how can you get the other staff to sing with the children? <laughs> and, and I know, you know, from experience, yes. um, I, I, I can barely carry a tune and I never let it stop me. And the children right. never um, had to hold their ears and were offended by it. <laughs> so, oh. so I think that's probably Lisa, what you find is that some people are just yes. too embarrassed or shy yes. or- so here's the thing, I, I always think of it as um, uh, the way you would model something on, like if you go to the zoo and you're encouraging your child to touch an animal that they've never touched before, you're going to model doing that by not squealing and going, oh, gross, and touching it. You're going to just touch it and look calm like it's a normal, natural thing to do um, and, and just carry on. So what you model is what the students are going to give back to you. If you model that singing is not uh, cool for you or that you're uncomfortable with it, then they're going to pick up on that and think, well, I guess I have to have a better voice to be able to sing too. Lisa, just to, clar all, just to clarify, like model. And just to clarify, she's asking how you get other, st other adults. <laughs> Right, I guess Understand. I know, but I, I oh, would, okay. that's what I would share with the, you know, in a polite way. That's, you know, I would just share that my philosophy is that if oh, I'm see. not willing to take the risk, they're not. Oh, I see. Okay. To just actually come so, out and say that. Modeling, I would actually yeah. nicely, of course. Yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> of right. course. Yeah. Let us know how you make out with that, Sheila. <laughs> I mean, I know that's, yeah, you just kind of, some people. It is just a challenge. Yes. It she is. Was, Yes, must take the risk. Yeah. Absolutely. But that's hard. All of us have things that that make us fearful or uncomfortable. But the great news about young children is they don't even know if you sing well. <laughs> they haven't developed enough auditory skills to make yeah. a decision. It's they a beautiful think it all thing. sounds good. So it doesn't matter. It's a beautiful thing. So um Again, I know, like, look at the, the folks that they don't want to leave because they think they're going to miss something. So, <laughs> and um, in respect to everyone's time, and I know that Rob yes. will be ending our recording any minute. So 
we probably should call it at this point. Um, we do look forward to seeing you again next week. I'm going to um, stop my share. Um, I'll show you one more time the link page in case anybody needs to get that down if they missed it. And there will be a uh, PDF of all these slides because as I did say, I rushed Lisa through. So some of the points you might wanna be able to go back and revisit. So that will be posted right. as well um, by tomorrow. And, and I'm sorry, Liz, I was go just gonna say, I will try to call the questions from here and find a way to answer those. If, if I missed your question, I would very much like to, to do what I can to respond. And, and one more time, Lisa's promo code is joy on her site. <laughs> A little songbird site, um, which again is very generous of Lisa to offer that to the folks that were able to be with us here today. And we so look forward to seeing you next week. And next week is outdoor music. I can hardly wait. <laughs> Great. All right, everybody. Thanks. Have a good day. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>